Uh, you can listen to a billion celebrities who will tell you that they made all the money in the world and their lives feel incredibly, incredibly empty. And um, it's not until you have people who can walk alongside of you and, and speak into that specific. What is up, friends? Rob here, and I'm back with a brand new Spitting Fire podcast for all of you today. And I am with my man, Mr. Chris Ball. Chris, will you say what's up to everyone real quickly? What's up? I'm coming at you with as much energy as Rob has, or I'm at least trying to. <laughs> hey, and I just, up, so teas. I just drank one of these loaded teas. I just drank one of these loaded energy teas, man. So oh, I'm, I'm really good to go. But uh, <laughs> listen, before we dive into Chris's story and what Chris has for us today, because I know he's going to spit some serious fire. I just want to remind you guys of why we do this podcast, why we have a new episode dropping every Wednesday. And that is because I live by this mantra that we were all created on purpose for a purpose. And I pray that something Chris and I talk about today will divinely inspire you to start living on purpose. And Chris, I don't know about you, but I can't think of any better year to start living on purpose than 2022. So my man, I'm so glad that you're with us today. And the way I always like to start off this in our interviews, Chris, is simply by just getting a 30,000 foot view of your story and then we'll just take it from there. Yeah, man, I've uh, I've got a pretty a pretty unique story, pretty wild story, but we're looking at a 30,000 foot view so we'll keep it really <laughs> we'll keep it there. Um I I grew up I kind of all over the place. I've been all over the United States. Uh, my family has a pretty wild background. Um I got uh, disconnected from uh, my father when I was young, very young, uh, which uh, put a a big hole in my in my heart uh, mm. that took a long time uh, to heal from. Had a great mom that loved me, loves me, loves me, loves me. Even today, she still calls me baby. Mm. <laughs> she, she's my mom. I actually work with her in this business, but um, as I was uh, maturing and growing, I had a lot of Rob, a lot of great people who came into my life and spoke into me. I always say it in terms of like, they just, they, they saw this, this messed up kid and they just turned my shoulders a little bit along the way, along this journey to the right path and, and finding um, healing in my life uh, through Jesus Christ and uh, just some great guys. I, I call it a mosaic of what a man looks like. It's a bunch of broken pieces that come together and, sure. and God formed manhood for me. Sure. And, uh, as a result of that, uh, wanted to make a difference, like wanted to make an impact in my life and in other people's lives and uh, felt a call to go into youth ministry, uh, was blessed to to have some guys from Youth for Christ uh, link arms with me and show me the ropes and got connected to a congregation in good old Battle Creek, Michigan, famous for cereal, that's Kellogg's mm -hmm. land, <laughs> and uh, was in youth ministry uh, for 16 years and loved it, loved it, loved it. Thought that's what I was going to do the rest of my life. Um, got a call from a very large church uh, in Louisville, Kentucky called Southeast Christian Church. Um, a lot of great stuff going on at Southeast. I went from a church of 300 people to 30,000 people. Wow. And uh, yeah, it was a big, big transition. Moved into uh, youth and college ministry. Um, moved from, uh, started in middle school and then went on to build groups in, in this college group group age thing I uh, did not expect um, was in 2008, the housing crisis, big change in uh, what was going on in the world. And our church started to say things like, we need to do more with less people all over our congregation are doing that. And I was right. like, uh, yeah, we probably do need to do more with less, not realizing that I was the last <laughs> <laughs> right, right. There was a handful of us. There was ten percent of the the staff got cut. College mm -hmm. young adult ministry got cut, and uh, for a season. And so I I had to find something else to do. And my wife and I we we felt called to that ministry. Um, we felt like we were supposed to stay there. Uh, so we saw the door to vocational ministry ending. Um, and I didn't know what was next, man. I I never built anything. I never, I mean, my wife came into our marriage with a do it herself toolkit, bro. I'm not joking. Like those were the tools that we had. So right. 
building some things that wasn't going to work, uh, selling something. The only thing I ever sold before was a refrigerator magnet to my, my grandma in sixth grade. Um, that was it. Uh, tough sale. Uh, so I wasn't, I wasn't sure what was next. I was picking up some odd jobs, but, uh, had a great relationship with Roger short. You guys know Roger through life insurance Academy advanced team, which is now impact legacy group. But Roger was a key volunteer in my ministry. And at the time that I knew him, he was selling, he was um, marketing phone books across the country. And I thought, maybe I can talk to Roger, but in a church our size, we don't see each other very often, you know? Sure. And um, ran into Roger. He shared with me what he was doing here. And uh, as far as vocationally, uh, the rest is history. Um, God has done a lot of great work and restored a lot of things in my life. And I will tell you, uh, I started this and I was talking about that manhood mosaic. But one of the great things I, I will share with you is that um, I have been reconciled to my father for the last 15 years now. Mm. And we have a very good relationship. We're very close. I have a family I didn't realize I had. And uh, that was a journey, bro. That was a journey to walk through. Um, but all of this, it's interesting how it all comes together. And and God is... Uh, He's the artist painting a picture with our lives. You know, I, I want to talk about something there because one of the things that I see in our industry, and of course, you guys are in the insurance industry on the life, mainly on the life side. I know we've all right. come together with the Impact Legacy Group, but Correct. myself more over on the Medicare. But one of the things that I see missing in our industry and a lot of industries is that healing from those yeah. scars, from those things in our past. I, my, my biological father, who's now passed away now, um, never really wanted uh, to, to go the, the church route, if you will, or the right. Christian route that my mom went. And so never really knew him uh, most of my life. And it did leave a hole in there. It, and now thank yeah. God, like you said, God sent people in my life and they were like mm -hmm. fathers to me, but still wasn't the same. But I think for me, and I'd love for you to speak into this because maybe you see this with the agents that you guys train and you guys mentor, is I believe there's a deep hole in, in our industry and a lot of industries for that that healing beyond just self-motivation, just right. getting pumped up. Do, can can you speak into that for a second? Yeah, um, I have, and I'll tell you this, Brett, like I wouldn't be doing this if there wasn't the opportunity to speak into and develop people's lives. Like mm. that, that was what was yeah. so attractive to me. It wasn't even so much about, about selling. It was coming alongside people who were fighting for their future, the best version of themselves, the people who were mm. fighting for that. And you know, the, the way we say it is, you know, we, we want to meet people where they are, sure, cast some vision and help them get to where they want to go. Yeah. Where they want to go may not be their best version yet, but we can help them see that down the road. That's what's exciting to me. And um, it takes that. I, I will say it takes that. I think a lot of people um, fall into this industry with um, in the back door, you know, a similar story to mine. You know, maybe they, yeah. they got laid off and weren't expecting that. Um, something didn't work out. An area of their life didn't work out. Um, some people saw an opportunity. Um, I, I think it takes some time with quality people. We'll say, you know, this power of association sure. to see that there's there's more to this than than money. And when you see that there's more to this than money, then after a while, you kind of have to look in the mirror mm. and uh, realize that if you are going to grow or lead people you have to be growing ahead of them. You have to move, you have to grow yourself. And um, that's, I mean, that's my story. That, that is complete. My, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you this quick sure. story about this. When I was a youth pastor, I was called into um, working with a, it was a citywide network of youth pastors. And I was a young dude. There was um, a lot of great conversations. People were saying some great stuff to me. And this guy who had been ministry for a long time, he was kind of a jokester. And he walked up to me and he said, Chris, people say a lot of great stuff about you, but I'm not impressed. And I was mm. like, okay, <laughs> I need to know who you are. What's your name? Right. Uh, yeah. He was an older guy. And we connected. And after a while, um, he said to me, we, we built this relationship. We have lunch together. And he said, Chris, your last name's Ball. 
um, is, is your father Timball? Is that your dad? And I was like, uh, yeah, how do you, how do you know that? And he said, I went to high school with your dad. Wow. And I couldn't, this is the same guy in the same city I was working with and just became this huge mentor in my life. And he shared with me this story about, uh, not having a relationship with his father and standing over the grave and saying all the things that he wished he said to his dad. Wow. And that, I mean, God planted this guy in my life, encouraging me to at least say the things I needed to say, you know? Um, and, and I'm, I'm talking about that in a youth ministry context, but that's still here. Like we, we, just because you're having success, yeah. that doesn't mean you're healed just because you're, uh, uh, selling a lot of policies, you know, uh, you can listen to a billion celebrities who will tell you that they made all the money in the world and their lives feel incredibly, incredibly empty. And um, it's not until you have people who can walk alongside of you and, and speak into that specific. Mine is, mine is um, passion in this is, is to, to see God do the work of restoration on our side of it, the best we can do to live at peace with everybody and not harbor resentment, not knowing how damaging that is to your family, your career, your life, your health, all of that. That that is that is that is what I get excited to see because I know, you know, Rob, that it doesn't always work out this way. It doesn't right. always work out with this perfect reconciliation, but I believe there's peace there. I believe there's at least a path for living in peace. Right. No, I appreciate you being vulnerable and willing to, to share that because I, I'm a big advocate in healing because uh, I, I dealt with a lot of just really deep wounds for many years. And even though I was a high productive person, yeah. I got a PhD in masking that. And I believe there's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Listen, if you're watching this today, I believe it's a divine appointment that when this interview drops, you're listening to part of Chris's story. And God is speaking to you right now. That, that's the direction I'm going to go. I make no apologies about it, right? But I believe God is speaking to you today that he wants to heal you. That isn't it about time in this journey that you just allow him to heal those deep wounds. Maybe it was a lack of a father or a mother, or maybe you were deeply hurt or abandoned in some other way. Mm -hmm. But I promise you there is a love, a perfect love that can heal that. Real quickly, let, let's stay there for a little bit longer, Chris. What if there's somebody watching today who really resonates with this? What is something that they can do to begin that healing journey? What 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 sustains you? Obviously, we know your faith in God, but what about something practical that someone can take away that maybe they're dealing with a lot of hurt? Maybe they're dealing with a lot of resentment. Maybe there's some other type of wound there. What would be a beginning yeah. step for them to start that process of healing? Well, I I can tell you this, uh, I, I, I'll speak from, from personal experience on this, okay? Um, the very first thing is, is perspective. Um, mm. and the only way to do that is, I mean, you can check it out yourself. I mean, you can crack open the book of John and see the story of this guy. <laughs> it changed everything, you know, and this is, I, it, it's not an audible statement, but it was pretty darn close, Rob, pretty darn close. And especially when I became a father. I mean, Cameron was born and everything changed. I couldn't believe they were handing me this life and saying, put it in a car. Are you nuts? You know my driving record, you know, right. all this stuff, all this stuff changed. And as I'm holding, holding my son, it was like God was speaking to me saying, Chris, your parents did the best they could with what they had. Mm. You need grace. They need grace. You, you are receiving this divine gift from me, this grace and mercy that you're seeking. They need it as well. And there's, there's a relationship that could possibly happen if we can all do this, you know, live in this. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. The next thing, and I don't know, I don't know. I'm just going to speak from a, a perspective of somebody who's been hurt by somebody. Okay. Sure. Let's say it this way. Um, I think you probably should write an honest letter. Mm -hmm. you should write an honest letter and honestly that's between you and god and anybody you're walking through with this whether you send that letter or not but you need to be honest with what you're walking through and the experiences of your life i'll tell you it took me i wrote i think it was five or six letters before i was comfortable with the one i sent my dad 
mm. because I felt like I, I, what was revealed to me in that moment of going through that process, you're right, a PhD in masking, love that, was I was uh, a, a professional people pleaser. Like wow. I, even in my communication to my dad, was it was a message of, of people pleasing, wanting to be liked and it wasn't honest. And it took a process of working through that to do that. And um, I, I think, you know, we just, we bury this stuff. Sure. And it, it's, uh, it comes back and it comes back in our communication sometimes with our families, with our kids, with our wife. Um, and, it, and that's where it creeps out. And I think we can be safe from that. No, I, I totally agree. And, you know, we, we tend to settle for just coping instead yeah. of truly being healed. Yeah. Right. Or at least I can speak for for my own life is that I even with religion, if you will, if we want to use that term in a broad sense, I used religion for many years to cope. But I never allowed that perfect love, if you will, to come and just deeply heal those wounds. And uh, as a former pastor and church planner, and um, I read a quote by Bob Bob Golf, who's one of my favorite authors, and I read a lot of his stuff and it really just resonated with me because you begin, he, he said, it's a lot easier to deal with difficult people when you realize you're one of them. Yes. And, 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 and I put that even in unforgiveness and offended being the offended and being the offender at seasons, right? I have offended people with some of my actions, but I've also been offended, but it's been a lot easier for me to forgive and swallow it and deal with it. Not that it discounts what any of us have gone through, right. but rather it's a lot easier to forgive and have that grace and bring that piece to the table when you realize that you've offended people yourself, you've done things in your own life. And that really at the end of the day, in the eyes of God, we're all in the level playing field, right? That we've all fallen short. So I I appreciate you sharing that. Let me ask you this in regards to the 16 years of student ministry, what was something that you learned during that season of student ministry that prepared you for what you're doing today? Was there something that kind of rises to the top that you took away from that? That's a great question. Um, I can, can I jump back to that? that Yeah, go go back. back, The the one thing I want to say too, is that I think it's people, it's important for people to hear this. If they hear anything in this um, forgiveness primarily isn't for the person that you're forgiving. It's for you. Yeah. It's, it's for, it's for freedom. You, you have been carrying this way too long. You weren't designed. Your body isn't created to carry this. And, and from our language and our conversation, we understand how that works in the sense like all of that is on the cross. Like that's, yeah. that's where sure. I can't carry this. You're going to have to carry this. But there's this great story of Corey Ten Boom. Um, I don't know if you've heard this before. This, that, that really speaks to the act, the, the action of forgiveness beyond the, um, what we call the emotion or even love, even beginning to love, mm. you know? Um, and she tells Corey Tim Boom was in her sister were um, prisoners of war during World War II uh, by the Nazis. Her sister, um, they went through horrific, horrific torture. You, you know, the stories um, historically and her sister ended up dying at the camp. Um, yeah. Corey, Corey was released, I believe on accident. Um, and, you know, Matt, big believer, uh, shared her testimony throughout the world. And she was sharing her testimony in Germany years, years later, um, talking about forgiveness. And she was shaking hands with people at the end. And a gentleman in the back walked towards her. And she immediately had flashbacks that this guy didn't know who she was by name or by recognition, recognition um, as personally hurting her, her sister, but he was heavily involved in the torture of them both. And he was walking up to meet her and uh, introduced himself. She's having these flashbacks of what he's done, who he was and all this. And he's asking her to forgive him. And she talks about the hate in her heart, even at that moment, you know, trying to be the person who she's saying to be. And she said, I, I can't do it. I cannot do it in this moment but I can feel God calling me to do this. And I can do this one thing. I can raise my hand. I can raise my hand. I can extend my hand. I can shake his hand. And the moment she did that, she said she felt the forgiveness. And she said, I forgive you, my brother. I forgive you, my brother. And it's, uh, 
it ain't easy. <laughs> it ain't easy. It is work. It is work. But we become, that's it. That's how we become the best versions, the best versions of ourselves is that stuff. So, yeah, yeah. And, and I definitely agree uh, with that is that once again, it's not discounting either what somebody no. has gone through the horrific or and I understand people may watching this statistics prove that you know, there are some egregious things that happen mm -hmm. to people. Right. And, and, and even some of those are watching this, but it will free you. When you begin to forgive and all the amount of success, money, notoriety, celebrity status in the world will never heal that right. unless you're willing just to surrender it and, and let it go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I, I, I appreciate you taking us back for a second and, yeah. and sharing yeah. that story. Yeah. But in, in regards to the student ministry, mm -hmm. that 16 years was there something that you learned during that season that prepared you yeah. for what you're doing today? Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting because I was, you know, I was 22 getting into oh. this. Um, I I had some youth pastors who really spoke into me. I mean, it was literally the power of a conversation. I would say that was the biggest thing I learned of taking the time and having to Coke with somebody. I mean, I remember, you know, I was a spaz. I was stapling teachers magazines together in class I, I was trying to get any attention I could get and just uh these youth group leaders would would just take me out have a conversation with me and I didn't I didn't see the value of it at the moment um uh started to build relationships with them and saw the value of it played ball with some of these guys you know they, they spent time with me in my space and I that's where I, I really began learning um the value of of life on life, you know? Um, and, uh, it's funny, even then I'll tell you, I, I got into it, uh, wanted to have a good time, change lives in my mind. We were going to do amazing things sure. and I cannot tell you how rewarding and hard that work was. Um, you know, we were running buses, picking up kids from tough parts of the neighborhood. Uh, they, they weren't, I mean, some of the stories we heard and some of the things we had to get involved in uh, with child protective services. Um, but the beauty of this, uh, those conversations is some of those, I mean, those kids are, I'm still in contact with them. Um, yeah. Some of them have gone through some very, very difficult things, but I know God has had his hand on them. We've impacted their lives. It could have been a whole lot worse. And they're wrestling in this journey with him, walking along with him. And, uh, Man, just that, you know, for us, we we say um, disciple making, you know, like uh, being able to walk alongside some of these kids and some of them are in ministry now and and doing the same thing and serving students and building groups and doing some pretty cool stuff. Um, I think there's a lot there, you know, uh, the importance of asking good questions, um, listening to people's lives, uh, giving them a safe space where they can be heard. That is that is so rare in youth world, you know, sure. like they're, they're putting their dukes up a lot of times in their, in their environment, but having a space where they could be heard. Um, and, you know, for us, it was important, uh, this idea of multiplication. Uh, even now I'm, when I talk to our agents or even in our impact conversation, it's, you know, we don't want to solve everybody's problems. We want to empower them to teach people how to solve those problems. Yeah, you know, that's, good. that's important stuff because it's not when people enter our environment, we want them to have the same opportunity that we have not work under us. We want them to be able to, to build a massive agency and do fantastic things. And we cheer them on the whole way. And we work with them on solving those problems and being a leader to do that. Yeah. And that's so different in our industry sometimes, because we, we know how nasty the behind the scenes can be and to be part yeah. of an organization that's that's cheering you on. And I think of Hebrews 12, 1, and I've shared this on other podcasts and in other training videos, is I truly live my life every day believing that all of heaven is cheering me on. Yeah. Right? That, that, and and, and I mean, what, you know, of witnesses. you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and mm -hmm. so to be part of an organization, which, you know, my wife and I are part of, and to know they're cheering us on from in their state going, go, 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 go. And it's, just this empowering thing to know that someone's got your back 
more than just contracts or commissions or whatever the case may be. So I love what you're sharing. I want to talk about the word impact, though, because I know that secure and, of course, you know, you guys on your end formed and and this this uh, Avengers group, if you will, this impact <laughs> legacy group. I but like I think, that. I like and, that. and I know that impact can uh, can can be one of those subjective words, but I love what you brought out about student ministry because I think we're so sold on the impact that brings us celebrity status or, you know, I want to be on the stages with Ed right. Milet and Tim mm -hmm. Tebow and nothing wrong mm -hmm. with that. Hey, I know God has that for us and, and for some of us, and that's great. But I think we discount the impact of just changing one life. Yes. And you know this as a former student pastor myself and being in ministry, there were times where I got a little weary and and and, and got a got a little discouraged, and I didn't realize that the lives that we were changing, you know, the people that you see in the restaurants and the gas stations yeah. that go, hey, I remember going to church camp with you, and that that changed my life. Will you talk a little bit more about that? Because I believe we just are in a culture that impact is only if we do this really big stuff and we discount what really impact can be at a yeah. lower level. That's so good, man. I love that you asked that question. And um, if you get a chance, uh, take a look. Everything we, I mean, we've been pretty intentional in our communication about what impact is. And if you if, if you look at our branding, um, you see a a drop. Like that's a funny thing to see when you see the word impact. You know, um, I don't know if I have I don't have my my hat here. I thought I had a hat, um, but. Uh, the, the the drop is actually cut into three pieces and uh, one uh, piece represents our agents the next represents their families the third represents our communities mm -hmm. and that's where we want to have a, an impact and and that drop is creating a ripple effect right so yeah. you know this this word um, the idea behind it is that and the science behind it is an object will stay at rest until an object moves it you know, and it takes an impact to move it, <laughs> to nudge it, to move it forward. And I think a lot of people are stuck in this industry, whether it's, you know, they're, they're honestly, I can't tell you, I, I don't even want to mention it, just how many conversations we have about toxic environments and not having what we're, we're communicating and safe places to communicate things or to be cheered on or to have, you know, a healthy yeah. competitive, competitive environment where people can win. And sure. there's some toxicity. There's some folks who are hurting just um, practically because they didn't, they don't have um, a reasonable compensation, you know, sure. and, we're, and we've been having conversations about who we are and these were rising to the surface. And we saw these as conversations that were happening on both sides of us that, Hey, we, we do provide a good compensation. We do have a great culture. We do have a great community. When I say culture, I'm talking about systems and beliefs. You know, we, we're very principled in who we are. And then uh, we have, you know, we're working towards building this, um, this, this, uh, this, uh, I'm sorry, this cause that, that we've talked about um, to be able to, to serve, to serve the community. So um, those, those four C's have been important to us. And it isn't always, like you said, being being on stage and, and feeling like that is the thing. I'm just telling you, I've, I've seen, I can see that as almost a drug in some, some cases where you're, right. your ego is being fed by this. Sure. And not, and not realizing like having these, these, these conversations with people, um, listening to them. Man, there's nothing like it when an, an agent says, hey, um, my my grandmother passed and you were the first person I wanted to talk to, wow. you know, um, where you're talking to somebody and saying, I mean, I know agents who've taken time to get somebody the right clothes to wear when they go out in the field. I mean, that's that that moves that moves people, you know, and they're they're still part of the organization. They're they're. They feel like they're winning now, you know, those, those types of things. And, uh, man, I love this business. I love this business because there's opportunities to, to really live it out. 
Sure. And someone who's been in vocational ministry, I was never full-time vocational. I We planted a church and we're pastors for almost seven mm-hmm. years. I call it volunteer-cational. We, we, uh, <laughs> we worked a full-time yeah. sales job in, in, in that and, you know, loved every minute of it. But what's interesting is, and I can share this with you because I think you'll resonate and understand, is that how we think that that's just ministry, right? It, it almost mm-hmm. becomes ministry of, of, of what we did over yeah. there at that church or yeah. churches mm-hmm. versus understanding that true living on purpose as ministry is just who we are. Right. And I was talking with somebody the other day and I said, I feel like I'm actually doing more ministry in this space, praying with my clients, yes. talking with them, going into mm-hmm. homes, them coming in, you know, the, the, uh, the office or meet with them wherever and that we're able to pray with them, speak into their lives, empower them. Have you seen that in your own life as you've transitioned over into this this industry? Yeah, man, I was uh, getting into the industry. Um, it was a it was an awakening for me, 16 years vocationally you don't realize how that parking lot can be a moat to real life. Um, you know, I was immediately, I was waiting tables. I was working at a roofing supply place and, and I'm, as I'm waiting tables, I'm working with a bunch of seminary kids. No knock to them. Cause I was thinking the same thing and they're trying to figure out if they're pre-millennial post-millennial yeah, <laughs> and, all these yeah. and, yeah. and I'm rolling, rolling silverware next to a girl mm-hmm. whose boyfriend beat her up last night. And that's mm-hmm. you know inside that that the walls of the the church when you're working vocationally there you can feel like you're doing your job in ministry and it was I mean I was awakened I mean I was awakened I do I feel more like a pastor now uh, than I ever have in my life <laughs> I feel like I, I'm doing more of the work than than I ever was before so I agree with you. Yeah, that that's awesome. I love the fact that you're a very humorous guy, right? <laughs> Every time I'm around you, you're you're always laughing. You just kind of have some jokes, and I love that. Um, talk about how important that is to bring to the culture, because I think, and my wife gets on to me because I can be this very intense little short guy, what? you know, and just going <laughs> after everything. And we know even the Bible says a merry heart doeth good like yeah. a medicine. But yeah. don't you agree that we lack that? in, in oh, every arena it seems like especially today yeah like man we we take ourselves way too seriously and there's just a part of it part of it's in my dna it's just part of who sure. i am you know um but i do i do think there's a sense of um i'm not sure why it happens but we lose our approachability mm, you know? that's good that, that was I think that's what, I mean, this is my joke. My joke when I was doing door knocks and going to see clients was I was working with this. It's unfortunate for everybody else. They don't get to work with this, (laughs) you know, (laughs) it it worked, right? Yeah. But um, I would laugh with people at the door. I'd laugh with people on the phone. Like, um, I think we have to be true, true to ourselves, but uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, we got to turn some people have to turn up the intensity. Some people have to turn down the intensity yeah. you know, and, and figure out who they really, who they really are. But if you're, if you're not laughing, you're not living. <laughs> Give some, some practical advice. Cause I'm a, I, I believe in, I love the motivation. I'm a content mm-hmm. junkie. I podcast, but a lot of times practically, we don't get that practical advice. How does someone begin that journey, Chris, of being able to discover who they really are? Because if we're to be honest, and we've we've kind of skimmed over this through some of this conversation today or, or talked about it briefly, is that a lot of people are scared to be that version of themselves. And so they live their whole life people pleasing or they live their whole life right. being a different flavor at the expense of really finding that genuine them. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? How does someone begin that process yeah. or how did you I'm begin that give process? Them some things to- I'm going to give them some things to write down. Okay. This is write down stuff. Come on, man. For this? I got my notepad right. right here, brother. Okay. The three things that we can control is our attitude, our association, and our action. And I can't tell you how important association has been to my attitude and my action. My attitude and how I feel about my life, my family, what I'm doing about my existence. And then action the work that i'm doing that association has been uh key people who i have 
I've always been um, someone who's reached out to to connect with somebody who's farther down the road with me. You know, even when I was a kid, I I talk about peeking through the fence. I had this crazy background, disconnected from people, but I was still this kid peeking through the fence, watching kids play basketball, and they were older than me, and I I would go over there and try and figure this thing out, throw the ball over the hoop, but. I'd learned from these guys who, you know, my mom probably didn't want me hanging around with, but was the first exposure of, of desiring more, desiring something and reaching out to have that conversation. And that, that kept going on throughout my life. Sure. So that association is so important to, to guys like you, Rob. I mean, people should be reaching out to you and having this conversation saying, man, every week I get on your, po- I hear your podcast, but I'm stuck. I, I need to have this conversation. They should be reaching out to you. Um, the other part of association is the the books that you read. That is the the yeah. biggest shortcut to association. You are literally getting a masterclass from somebody who's willing to share their mindset, how they changed. I mean, just anything. Think and grow rich. You know, like um, my my big one was uh, fierce. Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott. Man, that book kicked me in the teeth. Holy cow. Um, and I reached out to her. I said, hey, I'm a recovering people pleaser. Can you be on our podcast? And she she came on our podcast um, early on and we had her there. But uh, that that's even an association piece. Are you willing? Are you willing to sacrifice who you are now for the best version of yourself for that? Okay. So association, attitude, action. Then yeah. there's this progression that as I've matured, I, I, I really should have this tattooed on my lower back. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, this, this statement, okay? A belief is a thought that you keep repeating to yourself. Mm. It's like a record that you are choosing to play over and over and over again. And there's only one, one way to change that, and that is to change the way you think. So I'll say this slowly for everybody. A thought becomes a belief. A belief becomes an attitude. An attitude affects our actions. Our actions become habits. And that is what becomes our life. And it all starts with a thought. It all starts with that. And hopefully, through listening to your podcast on a regular basis, somebody is thinking something new about their life. You know, they're they're just, they're just, many times just stuck in an idea, in a belief. Like I can't, no, here's one. These leads suck. These leads suck. Yeah. That's a a belief that is an attitude that is affecting your action and your habit. If you believe that, do you think you're going to approach your, your prospect with the, with an attitude of service of helping them and their family on the worst day of your life? No, you're thinking, this is what you're thinking. They're not going to buy from me. Sure. And if you believe that long enough, you'll stop working your leads. That is a fact. So that's that progression. It's like, can you change the way you think? Can you start to change that? Because you are not enslaved. It feels like it. That's like an elephant who's tied to a post because they've been tied to that post their whole life, not believing they could break that rope. All you have to do is start changing the way you think no, I definitely love that as someone who's mentored people in, in the spiritual sense in church ministry and just also in the business world. I always would challenge people to change the content you're consuming. Yes. Right. And I would say it because the content you consume the most is what you become the most like. And it's interesting yeah. that when you change the content that you're consuming, you're feeling your mind, your heart, your spirit, mm-hmm. whatever word you want to use there. It's interesting how it begins to come out and manifest itself in your life. And you begin to listen to these successful leaders and uh, whether it's reading books or podcasts, YouTube videos, um, you know, a lot of people have a bad habit of consuming daily the wrong content and they wonder why their lives and their like Zig Ziglar called it stinking thinking, right? They wonder why they're, they're stuck in that cycle. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. Every leader that I've interviewed and that I've studied all have core values. Is there a core value, a staple that you live by that, that just rises at the top that you would mind sharing with us? Like, what is this one core value? And you may have many of them, but at least share one that you live by and that you lead others from. Um, 
I think going back to that idea that, well, okay, I'll, I'll say this. This is, this is what I believe, okay? I believe that my calling specifically is to be a shepherd. That's, mm-hmm. that's what I believe. And if I'm a shepherd, then I have to know where to find food. I have to know where to find water. I have to know how to protect like those things. And I, that's, that's a simple phrase that I, I remind myself of. I am a shepherd. And if I'm a shepherd, then I have to be connected to the good shepherd, you know, um, the one who models this and shows me how to do it. So that's, that's ultimately my, my number, my number one principle. The other one is, um, I think the one that I really go back to a lot in a lot of these, it's, I'll tell you, it's not easy leading. It's not easy leading an IMO. It's, it can be a challenge. Believe it or not, people aren't always happy. (laughs) They're not. And, and sometimes, you know, um, they're just having a bad day. And that, that principle that I go back to is, um, I need grace and they need grace. I need to live in that before I react emotionally. It's not necessary. I don't need to do that. So those are, I don't know if that that's super helpful, but those are ones that come to the surface. Yeah. And, and talking about leading people, because that was going to be a question that I was going to ask is, you know, this, you can't lead everyone the same. No. Right. How, how have you grown in that or what's worked for you in learning how to lead all these different agents across the country? Because that's, an, you know, being that shepherd and whether it's in ministry or in the business sense or both, you and I both know that you have to communicate with people differently, that people have different personalities. They have different triggers, different emotional things. Talk a little bit about that, how you've learned to navigate through because through that, because it can be tough doing that. Yeah, I can. um Let's say it this way. I'm still learning. <laughs> I'm yeah. still learning that. I have this, uh, if I could show you right here to my left, there's a there's a sign that says um, on my wall that says, I thank my God every time I think of you. And that's from Philippians 3.1. Sure. And it's literally above two chairs at my desk. So if I do have to have a tough conversation, I'm always looking above their head as a reminder that I am so thankful for who they are as a human being sitting in front of me. Um, I think, uh, listening closely to what people need, it's just like, you know, it's just like a sale. We talk about, about building core and finding out what's most important to people and helping them get what they, what they're trying to accomplish. And some of that for me is, um, simply finding out, finding out what it is that they're, they're looking they're looking for, but earning the right to be heard into turning their shoulders. That's, that's the part that's that I talk about. Like I'm, we, we've got to have some type of relationship. And I think there are times when I'll say, when I'll, when I'll say to an agent, Hey, this is, this is what I'm seeing for you. Um, do I have permission to, to challenge you on that? Do I have permission to have this conversation or revisit this with you? And if they're like, no, hey, I've got this all figured out. That's fine. Um, I'm not going to force them to become somebody they don't see yet. Sure. Uh, um, and and a lot of times, like, you know, in our core core values, like this this idea of trust. Trust is a core value. It's a personal core value, but it's also this core value that we have in our organization that um, we're going to be able to tell the truth. And uh, one one underpinning value in that is trusting positive intentions and moving towards positive action. That's literally built into our system. So if um, we're just assuming that, that everybody's not a, not a jerk, but I, sure. I may need to be able to communicate something that's very important to you as an agent. Um, I do tell the story of, of an agent I was riding with and for years he, he had talked about wanting to, to bring his wife home. I'd heard it over and over and over again. I was riding with him the revelation in writing with him was that he was probably working 18 hours a week in the field. Um, that was it. I mean, it was, that's not going to bring your wife home. It's just not. And I was looking out the window. I wasn't, we were just talking. I was kind of looking out the window. I was like, man, if bringing your wife home, isn't your goal, that's fine. Just tell me, I just need to know that. And then we can figure out a different goal. If it's to work the best part of sure. opportunity, let's do that. And, um, you know, I turned to him and he's, he's, weeping because he realizes that nobody's talked to him about this yet about his activity not matching what his vision for his life and his goal is so 
being able to to have that relationship, earning the right to be heard, speaking to somebody's life and telling them the truth. That's pretty important stuff. Yeah, no, you just, I think, gave some people watching this when this drops a masterclass on really how to talk with people. Because I don't know if you would agree with this, but I believe those tough conversations, you, you'll never be a leader until you're willing. Like, nobody, I said this in another view, yeah. none of us wake up going, yeah, I just want to have tough conversations with people and be awkward and feel weird Not and possibly do. lose friendships, <laughs> right? <laughs> but but would you agree with this that I feel like God has used those moments, even if I was the one giving the tough conversation, to change me just as much as with changing yeah. the, the people that we were talking I to? I would agree. And I, I would tell you, some of those tough conversations um, have led to some of the best relationships. Yeah, that's a good point. And, um, very strong. Very. Some of them have left. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. That's fine. They're looking for something different. And that's... Yeah. That's that's okay, but you are you are right that yeah. you know leading is work. It is, and it's the work of changing you. That is the that is the toughest part of that. You have to be willing to do it. You have to be willing to change. You have to roll up your sleeves. It is. Mm. I mean, that you know I've had people tell me like, hey, the way you're talking about this is is soft. You know, they feel like it's you know you're not jumping on people for doing this or telling them or you know, working on this behavior modification type of a thing. My goal wasn't to change somebody's behaviors, to change their life. That's mm, it. That's you know, good. so we have to, we have to come to a place of relationship and truth and in and, and grace and removing, you know, emotion in some of these conversations and being able to, to walk with people through that. And I'm like, man, if you think that's soft, you don't read the same Bible I do, man. This is, sure. you know, this idea, of the most powerful force in the universe of love being covered in blood you know, that is spent for us. That is, that is leadership. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to live that, man. That's a, that's a challenge every day, isn't it? No, I, I totally agree is, I mean, we know this very popular passage of scripture. It was his kindness that led us to repentance. Yeah, and we live in a culture where everybody just wants to point fingers and we believe accountability yeah. is just tearing people down. When in reality, the best leaders understand that accountability, even those tough conversations, there's so much love and grace being projected during those times that the people go, hey, this Chris Ball really has my best interest. And here's the way I articulate it, Chris. For years, I've mentored young men and women, and, and I always tell people, if they'll trust you in the three foot, mm. they'll let you take them to the 10 foot. Dude, that's great. Right. And, and so that's that's what I love to hear you're saying in a different way. But but yeah. I love that. Listen, as we get ready to close today, man, time has flown by. You have been spitting some fire today, my friend. I Thank appreciate you, you being so generous with your time today. Uh, I ask everybody that comes on the podcast this. If there was one word to use to describe Chris Ball, what would that word be? Oh, man, that's tough. And and I'm sorry, let me, let me, the, the great thing I, I love that you're communicating, I think we're saying the same thing. I, I feel like this leadership thing, you're, you're doing one of two things. In most cases, you're holding up a picture of who they say they want. They have to say this. They say they want to be, or you're holding up a mirror of who they really are. You're, you're holding up the picture. You're holding up the mirror. You're holding up the picture. You're holding up the mirror. Anyway. No, um, that's good. Thank you for going back and sharing that. Yeah. Um, present. Okay. So let's talk about that for a second. How is being present contributed? And I'm using this word generally here, loosely to the success that you've had today. So ask the question again, because I want to make sure I'm answering the right question. How is being present okay. contributed to the success that you've had today? Um, I think it's allowed me to build some really strong relationships. I would not be here without the relationships in my life. I would not be here without um, Dennis Sadal. That was the guy who had the conversation with me about my dad. Dang it, you're going to make me cry. Is this something you try to do? <laughs> Is this your gig? Is this what you do? Um, <laughs> but um, just being present with him. And when I say like, just being me with him, you know, sharing, sure. sharing that junk and sharing the truth and um, hopes and dreams and all that stuff. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, you know, Mike Weitzel, the, the senior pastor who took me on and I wasn't present with him. We went sailboating together and shared life together. And, you know, Johnny Mack, my youth pastor buddy, um, I've got 
tons of guys, you know, Roger, for sure. I mean, Roger short and, and, and that's carried on just being there, <laughs> just, just being present in people's lives when, you know, we had kids who went through hell and mm. we, were, we were there. We've had agents have gone through hell and, and we're there. We're there for the wins. We're there for the losses. And I say we, um, and I'm talking about us as an organization, my family. Sure. Um, and I, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, that's no. not always easy to do. Um, but I, I hope that uh, my hope is when people say, who is Chris? That's how they would say it. Sure. No, Who's and the, I love the, I, I love the fact that you're just being so vulnerable and transparent about that, the power of associations and relationships real quickly. For me, um, I met this guy. He's seven foot two. I'm five, five on a good day. OK, <laughs> he's seven foot two. We look like a circus act. He's 20 years older than I am. He's a United Methodist uh, evangelist, but we did a lot of ministry together. And I remember one day just in this small little town outside of where I live, he pulls over in this Jeep Cherokee and says, OK, we're just going to confess everything to one another. We're just going to share everything, secrets, skeletons, everything. And it was such a life changing thing for me that I will never forget that moment. And even though he was 20 years my senior, roughly. He's one of my best friends today. And it was the power of confession of just being, I didn't even know you could be that honest in church. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, I was so yeah. used to being yeah. so religious, but that day I became free. Mm. And uh, so I get it. It, it. it makes me almost want to weep thinking about it, that someone cared enough about me to pull over on the side of the road and just say, okay, let's empty out the garbage. Let's yeah. get real. And because of that defining moment, it, it has allowed me to have a lot of freedom in my life. I love it, so man. I'm very thankful for the power of associations and relationships. And listen, if you're watching this today, you may just be, as Ed Milet says in his book, you may just be one more relationship away yeah. from your life changing, just like what happened to Chris, just like what happened to me. Chris, as, as we get ready to close today, any any advice, just any or anything in your spirit that's just boiling that you go, man, I just got to share this with this audience today before we get off. Um, I, I do agree with you in the sense, um, that, uh, I think most people are one conversation away from changing their lives forever. And there's, there's always something holding them back from reaching out. There's always this one thing and you can get so caught up in trying to figure out what that is, that it will shut you down from doing it. Um, I think yeah. it's. This is, uh, I loved how you started this and you said, take immediate and perfect action. Yeah. Take massive and perfect action. Right. Uh huh. And, and I think in these situations, um, I'm not sure how you define perfect. Um, I think imperfect. That's what I was looking yeah. for. <laughs> yeah. 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 Taking massive and perfect action. Oh. Right. I love it. I love it. I totally agree with that. And and you're probably, if you stuck in this far into this and, and you're leaning forward and you're saying, man, I need to have a conversation with somebody, mm. take immediate and imperfect action that will change your life. Just do it. Just do it. Yeah. Where can we find you? I know you got the podcast, number one life yeah. insurance podcast. So talk a little bit about that and where else can we find you? Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, we really dug this, man. We started out this podcast. Um as just a tool for our agents. And then it uh, really just started taking off. We rebranded as Life Insurance Academy, uh, offering tools and resources for agents to be successful in life sales. We're up to 40,000 listeners a month. Um, it's, wow. Yeah, it's really popped. Uh, and we love it. We have fun doing it. Um, you can find us at lifeinsuranceacademy.org. Uh, you can you can reach me at Chris Topball. That's a very original name, Chris Topball at, uh, yeah. on Instagram. That's my Instagram handle. Is that what the kids are saying? Instagram handle? Yeah. yeah. Chris Ball on Facebook. Um, but yeah, you can you can reach out. Uh, would love to chat with you guys. If you have any questions about training resources, that's great. Or if you say, hey, man, I heard your podcast. I'm walking through this. I just need somebody to pray for me. Would you mind doing that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll do that too. Yeah. Well, I've enjoyed getting to meet you and just really love and just want to encourage you uh, you, you are very approachable. Uh, the times I've been with you, you've been very present. 
Um, and I just feel there's, there's a kindness that oozes from you. Mm -hmm. Right now, Dallas Keith, they may say different behind the scenes, but uh, <laughs> he's not on the podcast today, so we won't we won't go there. But yeah. but uh, so I just want to yeah. encourage you with that, that there is a kindness about you that I'm drawn to. Oh, thanks. Man. Um, and so I just wanted to encourage you with that. And as we close today, I'll just look in the camera and just say once again, we do this because I pray that we put fresh wind in your sails. That's the mm -hmm. way I like to say it, that some of us have just been sucked dry of that wind. Life has just punched us in the gut. But I pray that Chris was spitting fire in such a way today that puts that fresh wind in your sails, that fans that flame in your heart to say, you know what? I deserve to win. That's I right. have God-sized dreams that my divine creator has put in me. And this is going to be the year that it's all going to change for me. And I want to see those come to fruition in my life. As always, oh, please like, comment, subscribe below. Share this with someone who needs to hear this today. God bless you guys. Keep living on purpose. And we'll talk to you soon. See ya.